Hello and welcome back to this video of our agents JL and Julia tutorial. This video will be about something completely different, but I still hope it's very useful to you. Um, and you're already seeing maybe what we're doing here. This is about GitHub, Git and ways of sharing your code. And since we're using a programming language and you're, you will be working as teams, it is critical that you understand how you would like to share your code with others. And there is kind of like a de facto standard in computer science, um, how to share code, and that is using Git. Uh, Git is a tool that is uh, developed, I think it's by Linus Torvald, if I'm not mistaken, from, let's see, I don't know, uh, who developed Git? Linus Torvalds, yeah. So the Linux developer developed it in 2005. And if you're not registered yet, this you go to github.com where you will get a GitHub account. Um, Git and GitHub are actually two different things. Git is the underlying software such as Julia. And GitHub is a extension of that, uh, which is owned by Microsoft. So that is something to be aware of. Um, and so GitHub is kind of like a library while git is more like how do you borrow things from people and in this case you're borrowing things or putting things into a library that is owned by microsoft so it's something to be aware of that you should if you're creating account that you're sharing some of your data with microsoft uh, if that's a problem then there's other solutions i think you can have your own GitLab um, repository hosted in your own on your own uh, server infrastructure if you know how to do that but to be honest many people really a lot of people use github because it's a, an easy way to distribute open source and you can also create private repositories here so i would recommend using github for the uh, for the ipss summer school um, if you're uncomfortable with that you'll have to figure out another way of sharing code with your group members so this is a incognito window so that you see how this looks like when you're not registered. This is what it will look like once you're registered if you have a lot of things going on here. So the idea is you have your own account um, and you have repositories. You can also have projects where multiple repositories are hosted. But in our case, we will just work with repositories and um, you should see your own account here. And by going in this new folder, a uh, new repository, you can create a new repository and that is a place where you can share code. So I could uh, do demo delete me now, something like that. Anything uh, you can, I think is our space is allowed. Demo delete, uh, it will automatically add in the dashes. So demo delete me. And you can have a description. This is only a demo to showcase GitHub. You can make this repository public so everyone in the world can see it, or you can make it private so only people that you share it with can have access to it. You can also add a readme that helps others understand what your project is about. If you're just sharing it with yourself, that's not really necessary. And you can have a git ignore file set up for the programming languages that you are using. So if you're running a Julia, um, if you're running Julia code, you can add Julia git ignore. And if you're if you're planning to share your code, you can pick a license. Uh, in some cases, maybe is MIT. Yeah, MIT would be available. But if it's private uh, on your personal account, you don't have to set a license, so we can just leave the license out. And um, yeah, the git ignore, I'll, I'll leave for Julia in this in this case. So what I now do is I create repository. And what this will create is it will create this kind of website where all of your code is hosted. And you can, for example, oh, the license I was set up nevertheless. So I can go in there and then I can read the MIT license. This is what's in the file. So this is kind of like a file browser. And the idea is that any state that you that is loaded uh, into GitHub 
is managed. So, and every version has a number as a name. So this is the number. It can have characters in there as well. So um, this is the commit ID, and this is the state that this repository is in now. And if I change something, there will be a new number that is hard to predict from one another. These are trying. These are relatively unique. And the idea is that at any given time, you can go back to any of these numbers because several of them will exist. But that's not all of the benefit. Um, there are multiple benefits. And to explain these multiple benefits, I will just um, delete this repository because you can set up GitHub repositories directly from Visual Studio Code. And that's what I will be showing you now. Um, on Under the settings pane, you can basically delete your repository, I think down here. But here's also where you can invite collaborators to share the environment with you. I think it's up here, access collaborators. Um, since I have two factor authentication, I need to send a notification to my GitHub mobile. And then oh, let's quickly do that. I'm entering pseudo mode, um, enter the digits shown below to enter pseudo mode. So I have to go on my phone, uh, open my GitHub app. Uh, where is it? GitHub. And since I'm already logged in, it says authentication request, confirm digits for one, approve. And now this should be approved. Obviously, these numbers will be different every time, so it doesn't help you seeing these numbers. It has to be linked to your mobile phone. And now I can go here into add people and I can search by email or if I know the user's name and then I can add them and they have to accept the invitation. It's critical that people in accept the invitation because the invitations will expire after a certain while and they then these people will no longer have access to this. Ignore all the rest here on the left hand side where we don't need it yet. We'll go back to general and we will delete this repository. Um, we could also make it public, but we don't want that. Uh, we don't want branch protection rules. We don't want to transfer this. We don't want to archive this. We really want to delete this. I want to delete this repository and um, unexpected bad things will happen if you don't read this, blah, 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 blah. I know what will happen. Everything will be away. And um, what? This will not change your billing plan. No, I don't intend to <laughs> change my billing plan because I, I'm not paying. And now I have to manually type in the name of the delete me to delete the repository to prevent that your cat accidentally deletes your repositories while walking on the keyboard. Um, so yeah, now it is removed. And let's go back to the overview and ignore what's all going on here. I will now go into Visual Studio Code. And here I have opened the compartmental model in Pluto JL. Uh, that we've used in the last video. And this is not shared on GitHub. Imagine if I want to share something on GitHub, you might be in the same situation. You've now developed an agent based model, and you want to make sure that you can collaborate with someone on that code, or you want to make sure that it doesn't get lost, because you might lose your computer and you can still have access to GitHub. Where you would go is here, there is this on the left pane, there is this thing called source control. And if you click on that, it will tell you the folder currently doesn't have a Git repository. You can initialize a Git repository, which will enable source control features powered by Git. You can directly publish this folder to a GitHub repository. Once published, you'll have access to source control features powered by Git and GitHub. And that is what I want to do. I want to directly push this to GitHub and I can now give it a name. And I, this was called, the folder was called agents. I don't like that. Um, so I'll rename it to um, S E I R Pluto um, demo. And I can now pick either a private or a public repository. And in this case, I will make it public. So all of you can also see it. I'll go public. And then it asks me which, which files to upload manifest project and S E I R. Yes, these are files that I want there. If I didn't want the manifest, I could remove it. And then I can click OK. And then this is immediately published to successfully publish the Zumido repository to GitHub. If you're doing this the first time, you will have to put in your GitHub credentials. Obviously, otherwise, um, Visual Studio Code uh, does not have access to your GitHub. But I can now click here, open GitHub, and this will 
now go to the directory where this was uploaded and I can now see this is the SEIR, this is the commit ID and all these things were um, submitted just right now. We don't have a readme file and I think that's all I need to show you here for the moment. Oh, now I accidentally closed. What did I close? Did I close Visual Studio Code? I did. That's too bad. File open recent. Uh, do you want to save changes? Wait, no, I don't want to close this in. Open. So I'll open a new window. Here we are. And I'll open the agents thing again. That's where we were. So how does this work now? I have this repository. And if I now change something, for example, this is for, uh, the fun the SEIR function and I moved some things around I can add a space here which is a very minimalistic change if I save the file you will now see an M that means the file has been modified and git locally on your machine will keep track of which files have been modified and it will also tell you here under source control there's one pending change that, ha that has not been uploaded to github or to the local repository. And that's the thing that's kind of hard to understand. What, what Git does, it manages the different versions locally on your machine, and you can synchronize these different versions to GitHub or to somewhere else. But you have version management, so different versions of your files locally. And the modified file is what you're currently working on, but I can now commit this file and I will say minor. So what is it? Commit means I will say, this is a file that I really want in my repository. And here are the changes and here, every commit needs a message. Here's the message that I put in. It's minor change. Actually a good style as a commit message is telling what you've been done, what you've been doing. And I would say added a minor change so that there's a verb in this thing. So someone can then read who did what. And the, the commit now needs me to tell what files I want to commit. And I can have a look here in the file what, what happened here. And you can see here on the left hand side, this means there was a change. Uh, I didn't delete anything. So there's no red and there's no green. I didn't insert anything. Um, I could insert a, that's a new line that's highlighted as green. If I remove it, then this doesn't show anymore. Um, so I can have a look and this tells me I can go, oh, whatever I did, I didn't want to do that. So change the file back to how it was before the commit. And this ha tells me staged the changes. So these are changes that I'm comfortable with. So I put them on the stage where they will be picked up by the commit to put into the repository. So I put them on the stage and now this is a staged change. So if I add something now and save, I can have two things. I can have changes and staged changes. I was comfortable with these in the commit, but I didn't commit yet. And I have local changes in my file and I can tell him, okay, maybe I didn't want that. So I could go here and go revert. Are you sure you want to discard changes? Yes, I am sure. And you're going back. So that the space that I entered is now back to the staged version. When I'm not comfortable with the staged version, I can then go commit. There's also commit push and sync, but I will just do commit. And what commit does it is it writes the changes that I have staged into, did I commit? Yeah, it writes the changes that I, that I made to my local repository. So this is now in my own, li I have a library at home and now I put the book that I opened when where I changed something, I'm most sure that's the change that I want. So I put the back, uh, I commit my book back into my library. And that's what a commit is. It is making sure that this is a change that I want to have in my library. Um, this uh, It's kind of like a multi-step process. You have your editing interface where you change something, then you save it. Once it's saved, Git can detect that you had a change. If you're quite comfortable with the change, you can put it in onto your stage and the stage is still not fine. You can still revert the changes on the stage, but you, this allows you to have multiple layers of uh, keeping track of where you did something. And the idea behind a commit is you only commit things to your library where you're comfortable that your program runs and it works and it's fine. You can edit as much as you want on your, on your stages, but you commit something 
that other people might be able to use. And that's still local. And now what I can do, because if I go back into um, into the repository, where is it, by the way, that I just had? Didn't I Pluto demo? This one is the one that I just set up. So this change was still five minutes ago. It's still the first commit. It didn't do anything. So if I go back to Visual Studio Code, the change has not been synced and it tells me multiple, multiple times. Here it says sync change, one change needs to go upstream. So from my library to the GitHub library. And it also tells me down here. So I have changes that, that need to be committed to the origin. And in this case, origin main, that is the where what is considered the single source of truth for these files. And I don't have any changes coming in, uh, which is in this case a good thing. And I can just go commit. The, uh, so I will now push the changes. And the terminology is you can stage your changes to the stage. You can then commit them to your library, which is uh, to your own repository. And then you can push the changes to origin in this case to GitHub. And if I reload GitHub, you will now see, oh, the, the, the SEIR file had added a minor change two minutes ago by me, which is the change that I had. And now I'm also on a new commit ID. These files didn't change, but this state as it is, is a, is a change. And what I could do now here, by the way, this is also an interactive editor. So I can go in here and do uh, go edit this file and I can put a space here after Pluto UI and I can now commit a change here on GitHub. And then I have a commit message as well, app updated SEIR. I can even do an extended description that I don't need that. This is the author of the commit and I can decide to commit directly to the main branch or to a new branch. We'll ignore that for a second and commit the changes. Now these changes are directly live on GitHub. If you go back to GitHub, you will see update SERR, the third commit. Now we have three commits is live on GitHub. And if I go back to Visual Studio Code, what Visual Studio Code will ask you at one point in time, whether you want to automatically fetch changes. So there's three actions that you have with a server. You can push your changes to the server and you can pull current changes from the server to your machine but your machine doesn't know what's going on on the other machine. And that's why there is a second phase, which is fetch. Fetch basically tells Git to look, is there any is there anything new in the, in the public library? And if so, then you can pull the changes from the public library to your own library. And here I've done this automatically. And so it says there's one pull, one commit from origin. And if I do that, I will now have a change here in the Pluto UI where it's now this space is now here, which wasn't before. And now I have all the changes locally that were also there um, on the machine. So um, what else does this allow for? Now I, can, I might disagree that there's a space here. So I'll just remove the space again, save, and I will, I'm quite sure that I want to commit this. So I'll put it on stage and say removed uh, unnecessary. Is that how it's spelled? I'm unsure. Removed unnecessary space. And I'll commit this. And now I'll continue coding and develop my amazing model while some other person on the web or on another computer um, has their own ideas of what to do. And they will, for example, they might have, okay, this is where we should have a space. So I'll add a space here and I'll commit the changes, update SAR, another cool space, commit directly to main branch, done. So what now happens is we have two people working on the same file, me on the web, me on my local machine, and we have changes made to the same file. And it doesn't matter whether someone does this on GitHub or whether someone does it on a different machine and then pushes it to GitHub. Before I can now push my commit, so I have a change, I cannot push, let's, I can directly go here to push. And this will cause a failure, can't push refs to remote. Um, and the reason for that is I can um, show the command output is 
error, failed to push some refs, updates were rejected because the remote contains work that you do not have locally. This is usually caused by another repository pushing to the same ref. You may want to first integrate the remote changes, for example, git pull, before pushing again. So there were changes on the other machine and I cannot just push my changes. I first need to get the changes that are on origin because origin is considered, that's where, that's where I'm pushing my stuff and that's considered um, to be prioritized over my changes. So what I first need to do is I need to pull the changes. So I can go here and do pull and this will, you've now seen it, it um, uh, recognized by fetch that there was a change and now I've pulled the change so the space is here. And what this does on my local machine is now I have two changes. I have the change of the of this year and of the removed backspace. So this is technically now that it, it, it merged the change from that other person with my own change. But my change was a commit and that merge is a commit. So now I have two commits and I can now sync these two changes. Um, and what this will now cause is that locally if I reload here um, merge branch main so it tells me where did, did this merging happen um, this is where I made the change and now this is when everything goes well when people work on different lines if people work on the same line this is a little bit more problematic and I'll show you this um, by changing this line You're creating a simple SAR model in Julia and I'll write I love Julia save this is really what i want there so i'll stage my changes um, added some love and i'll commit this to my local repository so i'll put the book back in my library now this other version of me that person that random person actually doesn't like julia so he writes i hate julia and he's going to commit changes um, updated ser to show my colors and I'll commit these changes and what happens now since this is already added to the github repository if I go back to visual studio code I cannot sync these changes what we can do is we can fetch so now we see that someone else had changes I didn't integrate these changes so we don't see the I love I hate Julia here so it's not pulled it just it's letting me know I need to get something before I can push something. So if I now do pull, it will do this. There are merge conflicts. Two people have been working on the same thing and I cannot resolve this problem for you. You're in charge. You can now not just commit your changes. You have to make sure that the file returns into a sensible state. And you. Uh, there is this thing called resolve merge editor and this is where you can go and now this shows you the files that have merge conflicts side by side this is the result that you would currently do and now you can say okay i accept the, the incoming or i can accept the combination or i can ignore this and i can accept the current or accept the combination uh, where the current goes first and the other one goes next or I can ignore this change. And since I'm a fan of Julia, I will just accept current. So this is what I want to accept. I click on accept. And then this tells me what it what it looks like right now. So this is what we will have. And if I hated Julia, I could do accept this. And now we have um, accepted both and we've combined both. So that's not what we wanted. So I can manually edit in here what I want. And this is the version that I now have. This is where I can even say, okay, love. I could even have, uh, if I'm if I'm feeling um, diplomatic, I could put in both. And I am in charge of taking care of this, uh, of this merge. And I click complete merge. And then we have a completed merge and then the SAR is, is, and it also filled in the commit message for me and now I can commit. And I have two changes to sync again because there was a merge. And this will upload this new file to GitHub. And if I reload this, you would now see, I love, hate Julia. And yeah, that's basically how you resolve a merge conflict by making sure on your, so ever, whoever, 
tries to combine something that has been changed before they're in charge. You cannot just push the things back. This will break your code. Don't do that. Make sure that you have a look at every individual conflict and try to resolve it in a way that makes sense. Obviously, you would test your code before just submitting it. Not So I did it in, in kind of a very lazy way, but before committing this, I would probably do the change, then run all my scripts and test whether they work. And if they do, then I would commit. Otherwise, you might make a mistake in your in your merge. So what can we do next? What are other things that we can do with GitHub? So we've now seen there are nine commits and maybe we want to go all the way back to the original. So one thing we can do is we can have a look at the history. And some of these, by the way, are verified um, because these are the online ones. Um, and I could, for example, look at this one, update SEIR, and it tells me what the differences here were. And um, I can now also discuss this if you would like to. Um, and you can also uh, copy the full hash, the, the commit details. So this is just a short version, by the way. So if I want to have the full idea, I can click on copy and I'll show you this is the full name of the of the commit ID. So there is more than that. And I can click here uh, to go back to that point in time and browse the repository, how it looked like at that point in time. And this will show you the commit hash over here. And you can always go back to the main default branch, and then you're back here at main. So that is one way of how you can travel back in time. And then there is commands, and these are, I would try to stay away from them until you need them, where you can say, okay, I want to move all of my repository back to this state. And you can achieve this um, using different command line tools. And I think it might even be possible on GitHub, but I've never used it that way. And that's, um, yeah, there is a lot more complexity to, to what you can do here, but this already should provide you with sufficient tools so that you can collaborate as a group on a single project because you can distribute this to multiple computers and you can have people work on different parts of the same code and you can merge conflicts that arise from that. And you can have your things public as well. And maybe one thing that is still critical to understand is if, for example, you have files in here that you don't want to share. So, for example, if you have a password that you need to access your database and you would have a password secret.txt file where you keep your secret password, you wouldn't want that password to be put on GitHub. And for that reason, we have the .gitignore file. And the .gitignore file, this, I now, I added this file, this is new, so I need to uh, put this in my Git repository as well. But I could now tell it to ignore secret file.txt. And if I save this and add this change, added a git ignore. If I commit this and push this, now every no one can upload a secret file.txt. They can, but they will not accidentally do this. So if I now create a new file and say my password is super cool and secret, and that's my password, and I keep this under the file secret file.txt, the file will be generated, but it will not show up as a change in source control. It's actually grayed out because it's on the git ignore list. If I change this like that, the file will immediately become part of source control and you can now have it in there. So make sure that uh, if you don't want this file to be shared, that you have a git ignore where you put this file, uh, where you put the name of the file. And you can also, if you don't have this in here, there is another way of doing this. You can also right click this and say add to git ignore and then this file will be added to the git ignore. And in this case, we don't need this. So that's uh, how it was. And you should also do this with large output files. If, you, if your simulation generates megabytes or gigabytes of data that you store in a CSV file, don't put that on GitHub. GitHub has a limit on file size and you will break your repository. Make sure to only have things that you, that you need to generate your code from. So uh, if you have data that you load from somewhere, put the data somewhere else, only if it's 
sufficiently small, you can put it in your GitHub repository. <coughs> but it makes sense to, to keep data somewhere else. Okay, I hope this gives you a interesting um, insight into GitHub and Git. If you haven't heard of this, I hope this might still be helpful for you during your journey at the IPSS. And obviously there are multiple more resources to learn about Git. Uh, I think there's also a thing called Visual Git, if I'm not mistaken, where you can uh, download tools, but there's also uh, visualizing, there was this learning tool, learn Git branching. I remember there was a tool to learn Git using a visual um, website as a, as a little small computer game. Uh, if I find it, I will put the link on um, on the website so you know where to find it. I hope this was helpful to you and that you're able to manage your code on Git. And um, I'll, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next one.